This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting on over 800 stations, on Pacifica and NPR, and Low Power FM and college and community radio stations, on public access TV and PBS TV stations, and both TV satellite networks. Uh, we broadcast on DirecTV, Channel 375, Link TV, and on Dish Network, Channel 9415, Free Speech TV, and 9410, Link TV. We're also video and audio podcasting at democracynow.org. Our headlines are available in Spanish for any radio station to take is over 250 are. I'm Amy Goodman, and we are just back from Copenhagen. Even as global criticism of the proceedings and final outcome of the two-week climate summit in Copenhagen continues to mount, the United Nations is trying to put a positive spin on the non-binding Copenhagen Accord. Speaking to reporters Monday, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon insisted the accord was quite a significant achievement. While I'm satisfied that we sealed the deal, I'm aware that the outcome of the Copenhagen conference, including the Copenhagen Accord, did not go as far as many would have hoped. Nonetheless, they represent a beginning, an essential beginning. We have taken an important step in the right direction. Today, I'm joined by the scientist who first convinced the world to take notice of the looming problem of global warming back in the 1980s. Yes, I'm talking about the nation's leading climate scientist, James Hansen. But the outspoken director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies wasn't at Copenhagen. He decided to sit out the climate conference, saying it would be better for the planet if the summit ended in collapse. James Hansen also teaches at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. He's just just out with his first book. It's called Storms of My Grandchildren, The Truth of the Coming Climate Catastrophe and Our Last Chance to Save Humanity. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thanks for having me. Dr. Hansen, start off with why you weren't at Copenhagen. I mean, this is your thing. It was the global warming summit of summits. Well, they were talking about having a cap-and-trade with offsets agreement, which is analogous to the Kyoto Protocol which was disastrous. Before the Kyoto Protocol, global emissions of carbon dioxide were going up 1.5 percent per year. After the accord, they went up 3 percent per year. That, that uh, approach simply won't work. And um, I'm actually quite pleased with what happened at Copenhagen, because now we have basically a blank slate. We have China and the United States talking to each other, and it's absolutely essential. It, those are the two big players that have to come to an agreement. But it has to be an honest agreement, one in which addresses the basic problem, and that is that fossil fuels are the cheapest for, uh, source of energy on the planet. And unless we address that and put a price on the emissions, we can't solve the problem. Um, I wanted to go for a minute to a quote um, of Paul Krugman. Uh, Paul Krugman is the New York Times um, op-ed columnist. Uh, you had written a very interesting piece in mm -hmm. uh, the New York Times called Cap and Fade. Um, uh, the Nobel Prize-winning economist Paul Krugman said about your December 7th op-ed, uh, he, his response was called Unhelpful Hansen. And he said, James Hansen is a great climate scientist. He was the first to warn about the climate crisis. I take what he says about coal in particular very seriously. Unfortunately, while I defer to him on all matters climate, today's op-ed article suggests he really hasn't made any effort to understand the economics of emissions control. And that's not a small matter, because he's now engaged in a misguided crusade against cap and trade, which is, let's face it, the only form of action against greenhouse gas emissions we have any chance of taking before catastrophe becomes inevitable. Your response? That, that's not right. In fact, I've talked with many economists, and the majority of them agree that the cap-and-trade with offsets is not the way to address the problem. You have to put an honest price on carbon, which is going to have to gradually rise over time. But what you need to do, and Many people say, call that a tax, but in fact, the way that it should be done is to give all of the money that's collected in a fee that should be across the board on oil, gas, and coal, collect that money at the mine or at the port of entry from the fossil fuel companies, and then distribute that to the public on a per capita basis to legal residents of the country. Then the person that does, that has less than average 
carbon emissions would actually make money from the process, and it would stimulate the economy, it would give the public the funds that they need in order to invest in low-carbon technologies. The next time they buy a vehicle, they should get a, a low-emission one. They should insulate their homes, such actions. And those people who do that will, um, will come out ahead. Uh, that's, the economists agree that that's the way you should address the problem, with a price on carbon. Otherwise, the emissions will just continue to go up. Explain exactly what's meant by cap-and-trade. Cap-and-trade, they attempt to put a cap on different sources of um, carbon dioxide emissions. They say there's a limit on how much uh, a given industry in a country can emit. But the problem is that the emissions just go someplace else. That's what happened um, after Kyoto, and that's what would happen uh, again if, as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, they will be burned someplace. You know, the Europeans thought they actually reduced their emissions after Kyoto, but what happened was the products that had been made in their countries began to be made in other countries, which were burning the, the cheapest form of fossil fuels, so the total emissions actually increased. Let me play an excerpt of what the Australian scientist Tim Flannery says. Uh, he was speaking on Democracy Now! earlier this year in defense of cap-and-trade. Look, cap-and-trade by itself is not enough. But it is essential in terms of these international negotiations. And one way of showing that is look at the alternatives. Just say the US went with a carbon tax. That would leave the president in a position where he'd be going to Copenhagen and saying, look, we've got a carbon tax, but we've got no idea really what it's going to do in terms of our emissions profile. So countries would just say, well, what are you actually pledging to? What are you, how are you going to deal with your emissions? You know, the only method really to allow countries to see transparently what other countries intend to do and then uh, share the burden equally is through a cap-and-trade system. So it's not enough to deal with emissions overall, but it is an essential prerequisite for any global deal on climate change. The Australian scientist Tim Flannery. Well, I guess Dr. I would turn Krugman's comment around and say Tim is a great biologist, but he hasn't looked at the data on emissions and the effect of a cap with offsets. In fact, it does not decrease emissions. And that's one reason in my book I say that I'm going to update the graphs every month and every year, just showing what's really happening. Because, in fact, you have to actually decrease the emissions. And the only way that will happen is if the price of the fossil fuels is gradually rising so that the alternatives, uh, energy efficiency, renewable energies, nuclear power, the things that can compete with